Hello, my name is Diana Dirkby and I live with paranoid schizophrenia. The soundbite that you just heard is an extract from the composition Pastime with Good Company, written by King Henry VIII and performed by Chestnut Brass. The title of today's podcast is Excessful versus Successful. What do I mean by excessful? I like making up words, and this one has the feature that it blends two other words, something also referred to as a portmanteau word. In two words, it would read excessively successful. In Australia and the USA, where I have lived for a long time, many people only view someone as socially successful if they have achieved some excess. For example, they are excessively rich, excessively athletic, excessively smart, have an excessively long career resume, have an excessive number of top awards in their career, such as acting or singing, are excessively famous or are excessively conformist to some external measure of their proper place in society. Mental health advocacy groups put forth role models that include people who have lived or live with a mental illness or brain disorder yet are excessful. For example, NAMI Kenosha County has a webpage with, and I quote, 300 famous individuals with mental health issues, illnesses, and disorders. If you Google that last sentence, you'll find the webpage easily. There is nothing wrong with being proud and using as role models successful people with a mental illness or brain disorder. Many consumers of mental health, as we call someone living with a mental illness or a brain disorder, suffer terrible stigma. And to be able to point to 300 people who haven't let stigma and their mental health get in the way of extreme success can be immensely encouraging to them. They are incredibly inspiring to me. Three cheers to NAMI Kenosha County and NAMI for keeping a record of such extremely successful mental health consumers. It is important to stress that you can be successful without being excessful. There is the idea of personal success. As, as an individual, you are content with your overall life and happiness. Mental health advocates place a lot of emphasis on such people also. With the right therapy and medication, mental health consumers can have fulfilling and worthwhile lives. For example, they can be spouses and parents and have successful professional lives. It is again certainly motivating to know about role models who live with the same diagnosis as you and achieve personal success and happiness. However, I am always struck in these reassurances by the narrowness of their concept of success and the lack of recognition of the volatility we all experience. And this is especially true of mental health consumers, whereby we don't get the proper run of good luck to achieve a life goal that we may be passionate about. Also, we must recognize that even with therapy and medication, a severe mental illness or a lack of containment of one not so severe, can significantly impede a person from doing what they would love to do with their life. Mental health advocacy has to teach us to accept failure and help us to turn that failure into a new life path that can lead to fulfillment and happiness, even though it may not be termed success by our social peers. I feature how my two main characters deal with failure due to schizophrenia and stigma in my forthcoming book, The Overlife, A Tale of Schizophrenia. I introduced the book in my previous podcast, my first. I call this fiction novel The Overlife for short. In my view, excess on its own is not success. After all, we are increasingly aware that a small, personal imprint on planet Earth is better for it 
than an unnecessarily large one. So we should be vigilant about an excess of any form. Two characters are living with schizophrenia in my book. Jody and her daughter Sarah, who is the narrator. My character Sarah's quest for success is to be a good caregiver for her mother, to obey her conscience when faced with a difficult decision, and to leave room for the pursuit of happiness, all on an extremely tight budget. I posit that we can contribute to the mental health community and society in general if we enlarge our concept of success to include other types of success we may not yet recognise or are more typical of another culture and that we have to struggle to understand. That understanding won't change lousy luck, but, but may help people turn that bad luck into a worthwhile future nonetheless. No one can deny, for example, that it can be devastating for a young person to live with their first onset of schizophrenia as it destroys the ambitions for a specific career they have looked forward to all their lives. It's a terrible process for their parents to witness. The quest most likely to help in that situation is to concentrate on controlling the symptoms and to put ambition on a back burner. If young people can have practical help to better their mental health, their future may differ from what they had imagined before their illness, but it need not be bleak. Similar comments apply to people of all ages. We often forget that older people too have dreams. If you live with a mental illness or a brain disorder or are the caregiver of someone who does, Please write about your experiences and get the word out. Mental health advocacy groups like NAMI have resources for publicizing the experiences of mental health consumers. Even though I live with paranoid schizophrenia, as did my mother, and have read about it extensively, I know I have a lot to learn about others with the same diagnosis, especially if the circumstances of their life are very different from mine. So there is no ambiguity, three cheers for all the mental health advocacy groups, NAMI included, for listing famous people who were or are mental health consumers. However, let's also encourage a broader concept of success so we can have more role models. It's important. I will not discuss my career in these podcasts, as I want to focus on the fiction novel The Overlife. Though fiction, the story is inspired by genuine experiences of my mother and of myself as we face living with schizophrenia. Regarding the above discussion, I view myself as successful but not excessful. Rather than this being an assessment made through enduring an in-depth look at myself, I inevitably feel this way because of how my mother raised me. For every academic or cultural endeavour I became passionate about as a child, she taught me about true geniuses already successful in that endeavour. Accessful for her was to be a genius. She repeatedly brainwashed me that I was no genius. However, to counterbalance that, she always assumed I would do well in anything I undertook as I knew how to focus and push myself to my natural limits. I made a fine career as an academic, so she must have done something right. But that's not a story for these podcasts. I want to stick to the books Jody and Sarah. As promised, there will be no spoilers, so once the book has appeared, you can follow the podcast and read the book at your own pace. This podcast series is entitled Schizophrenia as I Live It because I wish to focus on how the book's narrator character, Sarah, and her mother live with paranoid schizophrenia. Sarah's experience is close to mine. And rather than putting importance on what you can achieve despite living with schizophrenia, 
I want to focus on the symptoms of living with schizophrenia and how significant adjustments to accommodate this brain disorder can still lead to a fulfilled and happy life. Sarah's outcome in life is not the same as mine, but schizophrenia as she lives it is close to schizophrenia as I live it. We will talk, therefore, a lot about my experience and Sarah's of confronting the symptoms of schizophrenia. The testimony of everyone living with mental illnesses or brain disorders as to what it's like to face their symptoms should be in written documents like books that everyone can access readily. Hiding your symptoms and saying, see, I am just as successful as people who are not mental health consumers, fails to give even the most sympathetic person any insight into your mental illness or brain disorder. Only through understanding what it means to explain schizophrenia as I live it can we battle the part of the stigma that wants your schizophrenia buried in a deep and lonely grave. So I will talk a lot about schizophrenia as I live it, but little about how I became an academic despite it. That's for another novel. Thank you for listening.